Welcome back to my channel and to the second in the series of six videos about the Rebel New Zealand Cavaliers Tour to South Africa in 1986. Today I will look at the first three tour matches, namely against the Junior Springboks, Northern Transvaal and the Orange Free State. I will look at the teams involved, actual match footage and who scored for each team and what was said after each match. Please subscribe to my channel to follow the rest of the series. The first match was a tough encounter against the Junior Springbok team in those days an actual Springbok D team and not the Junior team as is the case now. The All Blacks could not select their strongest team as some of the players were still yet to arrive. They nevertheless field a strong team with notable names such as Robbie Deans, Grant Fox, Alan Witten, Jock Cops who captained the team and Wayne Shelford. The Junior Springboks included players like Jaco Reinach, Garf Wright and Janny Breed who would feature later in the Test Series. They were captained by Lok Andre Markgraf, a later Springbok coach. The team featured one player of colour, China Bell on the wing. Ellis Park, home of Transvaal Rugby and the venue for the opening floodlit match against the Junior Springboks. The tour was on, there was no turning back. Colin Meads, tough and uncompromising, bemoaned his team's lack of preparation. The junior box didn't care. We don't play a lot of night games at home, but I don't think that was one of the reasons why it was such a close game and one of the reasons we almost lost. I think uh, prior to the game, uh, Colin Meads and myself tried to do our best to um, tell the guys what serving rugby players are really like and how hard they really are. And I don't think they really knew until they'd played the game. and. Uh, they didn't realise how hard they were, and uh, it was certainly a very hard game. Um, there wasn't much in it all the way through for that matter. It was only a, a drop goal in the last minute by Grant Fox that uh, enabled us to win it. Um, I think we played reasonably well up front. We mauled reasonably well. We rolled them more reasonably well. But I don't really think we took our chances in the backs. And, um, you know, I guess those sort of problems happen in the first game. So we were also without our top eight players who were still in the UK or you know, they, you know, they had arrived, but we didn't consider them. So, um, you know, we didn't, we weren't really at full strength, but uh, that's not an excuse. Um, I think it's just one of those first game matches on tour that uh, you have, and especially in South Africa. And I guess, um, you know, we were, we were lucky to come out on top. Captain that night was the rangy Canterbury breakaway Jock Hobbs, the man who'd led New Zealand to Argentina in Dalton's absence the previous season. Hobbs, strong and intelligent, a man who had represented New Zealand in 17 tests. Jock plays his rugby in Christchurch, New Zealand, and of course plays for the, his province, Canterbury, and um, he, he's not the Canterbury captain, but uh, he's played in all the Ranfield Shield games that uh, Canterbury defended in the last two or three years, and uh, oh, he's been a, a, a very good player for Canterbury and also for New Zealand, and uh, he's one of these players who isn't far from the ball. He uh, plays his heart out for 80 minutes, and uh, oh, he's been a, a great asset to the New Zealand forward pack, and uh, you know he's got plenty of years ahead of him still. Well tackled, Wayne Shelford, and uh, New Zealand is still going very well with it. Pika Reid, McDowell, but good work by the junior box. Out to Halford Muller. Halford Muller. And it goes there from Yanni Breit to Franz Vessels. Jakob Reinach chasing for it inside the Vessels. Franz Vessels back to Reinach. And he can score here. He's the fastest man on the field. And he's going to score under the post. Jakob Reinach. Jakob Reinach it is under the post. Captain Jock Hobbs waiting for it, trying to catch them offside. And uh, the All Blacks will let it come when it suits them. Jock Hobbs with it, holding it. Back there to Donald. Donald to Grant Fox and the attempted drop goal. Is it there? It is a beautiful one. Grant Fox. Grant Fox it is. Grant Fox, the boy from Auckland. So there it was. A snap drop goal by Auckland whiz kid Grant Fox. His only success in five attempts, helping the tourists squeak in for a one-point triumph. We're happy to have won. The uh, game was exactly how we thought it would be very, very hard. And how do you think this all goes for the rest of the tour? Well, I think that uh, 
all the games will be hard and that's what we've prepared for ourselves for. Uh, that'll be a very, very hard tour. Time and time again, the New Zealand forwards demonstrated their famous rolling ball, the one awesome aspect of their game that was to send out ominous danger signals to the men who would later plot Springbok strategy. But the national selectors had reason to smile. They were looking for a replacement for rugby lead defector Ray Mort, and they had glimpsed such a man on the junior's right wing. His name, Jaco Reinach, the Free State sprint champion who was beginning to show signs of international class. The next day, the critics were almost unanimous. While the New Zealanders were powerful at forward, they could still be beaten at three-quarter. There were those who claimed that 40% possession would be enough for a Springbok triumph, but the Springboks were still more than two weeks away. There was another hurdle closer at hand, the one South Africans were calling the fifth test, the big one against Northern Transvaal. Springboks John Gainsford, Dan Retief and Oki Wurstuizen warned that the Cavaliers were a team to be reckoned with and especially their forward pack and their running rolling malls. Good win by the Cavaliers, not yet at full strength. They deserved the victory although it was only achieved in injury time with a Grand Fox drop goal. The forward pack dominated sending warning signals to the spring box. The Cavaliers made a number of changes to the team including Crowley at full black, Wayne Smith at fly off, scrum off Dave Loveridge, captain Andy Dalton, strongman Andy Hayden and a formidable loose trio of Mark Shaw, Frank Shalford and Mary Mexted. The Blue Bulls featured players like Johan Jennis, Genius Naas Boota, Franz Erasmus, Mikirel Uris Madaduke, all who would play for the Springboks in the Test Series. Off to Pretoria and the New Zealanders hard at work under a blazing sun in the capital city. Andy Dalton will be making his first appearance on tour. Under him, a team of Test Match calibre, a tough one. We realised it's going to be a very hard game, and uh, we are approaching it in that vein. The danger man, as always, will probably be nice boots. Have you got any special tactics or plans worked out for him? No, nothing special. Nothing from any other game. We, we approach every game in the same uh, with the same attitude, and uh, there'll be no different tomorrow. With rugby fever now running at fever pitch, speculation mounted as to how the New Zealanders would cope with the illustrious Blue Bulls. It will be their first meeting with several Springboks. Among them, fly half Nas Boerter. Boerter, the big match winner with the deadliest boot in world rugby, captain of the Blue Bulls, a one-time American gridiron trialist who'd regained his amateur status. The most controversial player in all South Africa, potentially the biggest factor between victory and defeat. It was to be a bitter battle, and referee Francie Muller would have his hands full. Here they come, that's Andy Dalton in the front. Looks like Victor Simpson behind him. That's Victor Simpson. Loveridge. Shelford. That's Wayne Smith. Ashworth. And here comes Nas Boerter. Wait for the roar. That's going to be fullback Pierre and Crowley to kick off. <coughs> Lovely kick hanging in the air taken by Louis Moorman. Look at those all black forwards going bashing in there, but back to Nasporta. Difficult one and well taken indeed. Mark called for and Uli Schmidt coming up very quickly to the tackle, but it was Kieran Crowley who called for the mark and was given it and quick one to himself and flips it to his fly half Wayne Smith. Wayne Smith tackled looking for support, but a penalty there for coming in the wrong side of the scrum there. Interesting, Louis Moorman in his first years for Northern Transvaal always st stood the back of the line out. Uh, this time it looks as like Gary Wetton got it back.
And a penalty there, and a little bit of argy-bargy there. Young Lock and Cowboy Shaw. And uh, it's Shaw who's penalised. Here is Nasdaq with an opportunity to open the score. And is it curling in? Yes, it did. It curled in at the last minute. And the big crowd waiting expectantly. That is Billy Osborne with it now. And that could have been an intercept. Not a very good pass by Osborne. Picked up by Mike Clamp. And Clamp inside to Osborne again. And Kieran Crowley with it. And Mexted backing up. Mexted Shelford as well, trying to get it back. But the referee gives a penalty. to Northern Transvaal and uh, the touch judge also put his flag out at pointy to Northern Transvaal side and the referee will ask him what? I will sort it out, alright? Okay. He's flag out there. Shut up, crap. It happened just before half-time. The teams waging a relentless struggle, neither prepared to give an inch. A line-out forms. New Zealanders try line Andy Hayden going for it helped by the Gary players Hayden. emerge from the loose scrum Andy Dalton giving Gary chase but the West's Dave Loveridge breaks from behind the punch a swinging right Loveridge cross from Burger Heldenhase the most lethal blow in the game from behind the New Zealand skipper crumples to the deck and slowly gets to his knees the referee signals and the first aid men and last Buerta gather round to have a look referee Muller leaves the scene to consult with the touch judge the name Burger is clearly mentioned. The punch that was to cause an outrage. Andy Hayden sees it, lunges after Heldenhase and lashes out. Dalton departs, bitter realization on his face, the jaw broken in two places, a tour that lasted just 37 minutes. So we have the replacement, Hika Reed has come on at hooker, and it is Northern Transvaal ball, left for play in this half, only about three minutes of ordinary time. And the ball out here to Kunis coming into the line, and he left it available for Kipi Nell to kick it up, and Crowley is there, inside his 22, as he's challenged there by Paul Buertis and Christo Spannenberg. That's Crowley. And that's Buddha not kicking his up and unders as well as usual. He normally times them rather better. That's Victor Simpson, Gary Wetton, and Frank Shelford. This is good driving forward play. Mark Shaw, the last man with the ball. Loveridge back to Wayne Smith. And he's got a few guys with him this time. And out it goes Victor Simpson. And there is uh, Mike Clamp. Clamp will score. Being chased by Buddha. Mike Clamp is going to score, though. And Mike Clamp over for a lovely try. Try there by Mike Clamp. And that was better passing. They had the overlap. And Mike Clamp looking pretty pleased with himself. Murray makes Ted at the back. Loveridge, a long one out to Smith, to Billy Osborne. And Shelford, at least uh, the Simpson, Victor Simpson, who had such a good game in the first match. Good ball back to Loveridge. Loveridge setting up his forwards. Mark Shaw is having a very good game indeed. Cowboy Shaw from Manawatu. And back it comes to Loveridge. Pass out there to Wayne Smith. He has Clamp with him, but he's tackled. Shelford doing good work. And it is all New Zealanders now. And they want the second phase ball. Loveridge going around the blind side. Pika Reed is there. Crichton is there. And As Uli Schmidt punched Gary Whitten on the ground. Keeping him away, but... The ball already Referee Muller again consults his touch judge and returns to tell Schmidt, I saw you punch. Of course, yes. Now I say the woman of his son. It's Gary Wetton. And it was certainly superb control by the All Blacks. We'll see it again. Hicka Reed, number 21, going in there. There's Gary Wetton, number five. There he picks it up. The referee, the touch judge has already got his flag up. So the ball must have been out before that that came back to Gary Wetton. 
Moorman there taking it cleanly for Northern Transvaal up to Nas Buerta. What will he do now? There's the grubber kick through. In the way was Wayne Smith. And a loose ball. Northerns get it. Back to Uli Schmidt. Uli Schmidt flicking it out to Buertas on the far side. And but he's tackle and uh, the referee's giving a high tackle. Whistle. Head high tackle by Mike Clamp. Well, I suppose, Chick, if ever nice Buerta has had a pressure kick, this is it. He's yes. had them before. He had one in a test match against the British Lions in 1981, was a Chick, I think, from the touchline in Port Elizabeth in driving rain. Yes. This one Hush falls over the crowd as Buerta takes aim. And in the Curry Cup final, when he, he is, connects, he and the ball curls to towards its target, to only to find the near upright and rebound into play. The New Zealanders have won again by a single point. The man with the golden boot showing himself to be only human after all. And a brutal match is over. And the referee is looking at his watch. And again, I don't think the guys realise how hard the Savagan players are. And um, they certainly realise during and after that game that uh, these guys here hard and they play for 80 minutes and that was just another hard game and uh, another one pointer again so um, you know, I think we got a lot out of that game even though it wasn't a, a great spectacle of a game it was uh, a typical hard Northern Transvaal all back in Canada that uh, I've been on or played in twice before and uh, this one was no different. Nice border. It's amazing the amount of criticism that he gets through the media in particular. Um, to us, he is a, a great player. He, he's been criticised because he kicks too much and probably at times he, he may do, but he's got other gifts that we saw in that game and uh, since. And he's a, a very gifted player. He's got a tremendous head on him. He not only can kick well, he can get himself out of trouble time and time again. It's obviously a part of the game over here that you know, the blocks on either side of the jumper supports a part of the effect that we think they lift. And uh, there's no doubt about it. If a player goes up and stays up, he's got to be lifted. There's no doubt about that. But it seems to be an accepted part of the game here, where elsewhere in the world it isn't. And the referees uh, referee as such. And it's something that we're just not used to at home. And he said, with South Africa not playing international rugby that of often, there's not very much of a cross-pollination of ideas and how the different countries adapt to laws. Because we also, in South Africa, we play under how the laws are interpreted by our referees. Although it was a close victory, the punters and rugby writers wrote that the Cavaliers fully deserved to win. They had the territorial advantage and especially in the first half, their forward pack dominated. The support play and rolling running malls were first class. Norundras Wall, however, shaded them in the lineouts. It was a very physical match and the referee Franz Muller had his hands full. The local team showed that the talent is there to take on the New Zealanders in the Test Series. Well, it happened so quickly I didn't really have time to, uh, to realise what had happened. Uh, now, with uh, several weeks to reflect on it, um, obviously very extremely disappointed not to be part, taking a bigger part in the tour. Uh, it's one of those silly things that sometimes happened, happens in the, uh, the game of rugby, punches out in the open like that. Uh, one of those silly things that should never happen. So, uh, you know, I'm pretty bitter about it now, I suppose. Um, more through the frustration of not being able to play uh, the rugby that I had hoped to uh, when I came over here. Obviously, many of us, including myself, have been looking forward to this tour for, for three years at least, um, particularly so with it being cancelled last year. We've had to work uh, very hard to get here, and to only last 36, 37 minutes, uh, that's pretty disappointing. I've been playing international rugby for something like 10 or 11 years and never been hit like that from behind. Um, you know, obviously, sometimes during the game, tempers do get a little, um, a little hot, and you do get the odd punch thrown, but uh, normally people stand up to you. 
Um, I think the disappointing thing about it was the fact that Mer Berger uh, um, carried on so much after the event. Uh, if he had just shut up, I think the, he possibly would have been forgotten and uh, would have been to his benefit too, but he seemed to be intent on uh, speaking to the media about the whole issue, which I don't think did him any good. Um, I've never spoken to the man myself, but... Uh, Has he uh, not spoken to you since? No, I've never spoken to Bergen, no. Yes, um, what happened on Saturday, I mean, I was in the loose scrum and I, I received a blow and, um, and then I retaliated and, and it was in the heat of the moment. So um, the two teams were very highly motivated and that sort of thing happens. Um, I mean, I'm sorry I, his jaw was broken, but I mean, there was a lot of punches thrown and nothing, and no other jaws were broken. So it was just a pure accident. We were disappointed to lose our skipper. Um, he had a big effect on, on the tour, uh, even after his jaw was broken, and I'm sure he would have had an even bigger, bigger effect had he been playing. We wanted to get over the initial blow to the side and get the morale back up again. The cry, ban Burger Heldenhase, is trumpeted throughout the land. Danny Craven calls a joint meeting of his executive and disciplinary committees, and they instruct selectors at all levels not to consider players guilty of misconduct. Heldon Hayes is given no formal hearing. His judge and jury, the television camera, and he is never officially punished. It is only much later, after he fails to make the Springbok team, that it becomes known that the rugby board would have vetoed his selection. ...can never be condoned or supported by the SARB. From my point of view, he should have been given a suspension, and uh, everyone in the sundry would know what the suspension is, and then once, that, once he's served that sentence, he's back ready to play again, not only for his club or his province, but also for the South African team. For the game against the Orange Free State, the Cavalier selectors made several changes. Craig Green, Warwick Taylor and Prop Gary Knight played in their first matches. Mike Clamp and John Oswald would play in their third match in a row. For the Orange Free State, Springbok block Rudy Versace could not be considered as he was still in Italy. Franz Wessels, Jakko Reinach, Helgert Miller and Wessel Leifert were members of the junior Springbok team that played the Cavaliers in the first match and this would therefore be their second match against the visitors. A hat-trick from Craig Green and 19 points from the boot of Grant Fox. And so is Murray Mexted, Murray Mexted, whatever the ball is. Andrew Donald waiting for it, picked up by Ashworth. Over there to Craig Green, that's Craig Green on the wing. Man from Canterbury, being chased by Jacob Reiner. He dived over, has he got his try? Yes, he has a beautiful try there by Craig Green. And Ashworth getting the ball back. Donald out to Grant Fox. This is the man to Victor Simpson. Simpson looking for support. And there is Hicker Reed, and that's Grant Fox. Out there to Craig Green, and Craig Green goes to the corner, good score, Craig Green in again, Craig Green, a beautiful try. Two, four, you can see the, where the line-out is, midway between the free state 22 and the halfway, and tap back to Christopher Ferreira, Kasselman, the vehicle ball is not a knock-on, went back to Helcott Muller, what will he do now, good chip into the box, has it gone too far, Mike Clamp lets it bounce. And up goes Helcott Miller, tackles him, and out to Robbie Deans. Robbie Deans gets past Kasper Vessels. And Craig Green with it. Craig Green, and that wasn't a knock forward. Craig Green's going to score. It's his third try under the post. Craig Green, a lovely piece of opportunist work there by Craig Green. The ball was knocked, knocked forward by him. It was knocked backwards by one of the free staters. So that is Craig Green's third try. Yeah, I think up to that stage, that would have to be probably our best all-round performance. Although it wasn't uh, probably our top side or a top side, uh, the guys performed uh, extremely well and they, they certainly um, played well up front and the backs played well. And in fact, uh, Craig Green scoring three very good tries on the wing, which sort of spoke for itself. The Cavaliers scored their greatest victory ever over an Orange Free State team of a representative New Zealand team. The biggest victory to date was when the All Blacks beat them 30-12 in 1970. The visitor forwards pack again dominated and the boot of Grand Fox ensured that they always played on the front foot. Their backline were also outstanding and Craig Green outplayed Jakko Reiner. The visitors were however guilty of some foul play and were penalised 13 times against 9 for the Orange Free State. For the local team's scrum off Christopher Harris showed that he might find himself in the spring test team 
for the first test. Persistent rumours that the players were paid big money were constantly denied. Almost to a man, every international player scoffs at an outdated amateur code. The thin line already crossed in Australia and France. Any benefits derived from this tour would not make these players more guilty than their predecessors. Force the International Rugby Board to reassess its own position. The problems which have been created have been created by the fact that... Um, for one reason or another, the All Blacks didn't come to South Africa last year and the British Lions are not going this year. And the international board members have tended to hide behind uh, the uh, climate of world opinion. What they've lost sight of the fact is that their players are determined to go to South Africa, either officially or unofficially. And I think that this tour will uh, concentrate their minds wonderfully on the uh, touring schedules for the future. And how do you think would it influence them? Well, because they know very well that if, if they don't organize tours to South Africa, and if they don't make sure that their players get there, then people, other people, will take the players themselves. I traveled up from uh, Sydney to Hong Kong, sitting next to Alan Jones, the Australian coach. And uh, Alan made it very clear that uh, the Australian players were determined to go to South Africa. Now, he said, if we as a union don't reflect their wishes, he said, we shall fail. He said, not only that, they will go under other auspices, and it's much better that, we, that they go under the official Australian Rugby Union auspices so that their uh, tour can be controlled. He said, if, they, if we don't organise that tour, then sure as God made Kerry Packer, somebody else will. It was nice having breakfast, a long breakfast with, let's say, the Australians who have been denied, you know, the opportunity of coming here and chatting to these great players, you know, who went over and won the Grand Slam. But in themselves, they can't claim much because they haven't come to South Africa and beaten us here. And, you, you know, the Poitivans and the Slacks and the Toynemans and these guys chatting to you and you yourself finding out that their burning desire to come here and play against us. Australia will follow. Um, and I think you'll find France will follow straight after them. So it's a case of now saying, well, let's get some control over this and let's um, have the IRB and our member unions at least recognise where we're coming from. This concludes the second part of the six-part video series about the 1986 Rebel New Zealand Cavaliers tour to South Africa. Next week, I'll look at the matches against Transvaal and Western Province and also the all-important first test at Newlands. If you enjoyed this video, please hit that like button and also subscribe to my channel. Thanks for watching and until next time, cheers.